Hi and welcome to Rose Red Homestead. Today we're going to talk some more about water. Uh, Jim and I are celebrating the third anniversary of our startup of our YouTube channel. And one of the early set of videos that we did was on water. We did water one, water two, and water three. And one of those is our most watched video and it has to do with sanitizing water. On Monday of this week, we were out in the greenhouse and did a short video on dual purpose for storing water out in the greenhouse. And that elicited so many questions and comments that what I did was I went through all of the comments and I pulled out people's questions and comments that they uh, were wondering about. And I had referred several of them to that original Water 1, Water 2, and Water 3. But I thought it might be good to resurrect some of those ideas and also blend those ideas with some of the things that are newer, newer information. So we are going to talk about today um, how to sanitize and store your own emergency water and why that is so important. And I've pulled seven questions that we're going to address. So we'll get started on that and it goes directly to self-reliance and emergency preparedness. And we'll be right back. questions that I was a little bit surprised at was why do we even need to store water in the first place? Um, if we haven't really thoroughly thought about that, it's just imperative that we store water, a little bit of water, some water. Every health organization around the world in every country recommends that we store enough water to get us through a few days of some kind of an emergency whether it is a weather situation or a, a natural disaster like earthquakes or floods or, or wildfires. So often when these happen, and we've seen these in the news with more and more frequency, and it disrupts our normal life to the point that sometimes our water supply is cut out. And so having a few days supply of water is really, really imperative. Everyone should have water. Well, the second question is, how much do I store? Jim and I don't do the doom and gloom thing. What we do is upbeat, be prepared, and things will be okay. And that's how we look at water as well. Many organizations around the world have the answer for us in terms of how much we should store. And that is our own government agencies, both federal and statewide, and also um, towns, cities, do the same thing. Other organizations like churches, everybody is talking about have a safe supply of water on hand. And we should plan for about three days of water, minimum. The amounts that are suggested is one gallon to one and a half gallons per person in your household for three days. Jim and I have bumped that up. Our own bottom line is two gallons of water for each of us per day and we do it for 14 days and you can do the math on that to figure out how much we have. So we have stored water right here in our kitchen in five gallon barrels um, and we have about 40 gallons just right here and we have other water stored as well including what we've put out in the greenhouse. The next question that came up so often was what containers do I use? Can I use this or can I use that? And that is really an important question. One of the big ones is, can I just wash out milk cartons and store water in milk cartons? And yes, you can. Uh, just put them in a place where when they break, and they will, and leave a water mess, that it will not disturb anything else, that it just will get on your garage floor and, and won't get any food stores wet or anything like that. One of the things that I do, since I am a canner, is that every time I take quart jars out of the dishwasher, I fill them with water and put them back out there waiting to be used again. Now, one of the tricks in doing this 
and um, these flats, these lids that I use, have been previously used. I bring the water all the way to the top so that when I put the lid on, the lid is actually touching the water so that there's no air space. Now I have done this literally hundreds of times and I bring them back in and water my plants with them when I'm ready to do a batch of canning that requires me to use these jars. And in the hundreds of jars that I have done this with, there has been only one time where when I uh, took the flat off, there was some blackish mold growing right here. Well, of course, then I would count this water as having been contaminated. And so we'll need to know what to do when that happens if we don't want to throw the water away. And there would be some cases where we would want to sanitize that water instead of dumping it in our garden or watering our plants. And we'll get to that in just a minute. I am going to put the links to our other water videos at the end of this video. So all you have to do is just click on those links and it will take you to those other ones. There is much more in-depth information. And you will notice that those, you will know that those are our early videos. Lighting wasn't as good, sound wasn't as good, um, but the information is still as good as it was then. I talk about in one of those videos the different designations of plastics. And so you might want to look at that video to be sure that when you look on the bottom of a plastic container, that the little symbol that is down here, it's a recycling symbol. But those recycling symbols tell us numbers one through seven, and these blue ones are number two. These are number one. You don't want to re refill these. Number ones are intended for single use. But good heavens, if this is all you have, refill these and then keep them. Um, so where do you get the water that you're supposed to store? For many of us, that water comes right out of our taps. And we've had a lot of pushback from people who live in areas where the water comes, that comes out of their taps is not the water that they would like to store. My sister Cindy, who appears on some of our videos, their water does not taste very good. And so what are the alternatives? Well, find a source, a friend, a relative, someone where you can use their water if it tastes better. You can buy water. You can buy cases of this water and just shove these cases right under your bed or at the bottom of a closet. Then put a blanket over it and put your shoes on the top of it. So be creative in where you can store water, but for heaven's sake, get enough water that would keep you alive for three days to a week to two weeks, whatever you think is necessary. So in preparing the containers, I demonstrated that in our micro moment this week, I use a very strong bleach solution in brand new barrels or we've had this one for a really long time and if I were to redo the water in here um, empty what's out and then refill it I would also do that same thing to this too I use about a fourth of a cup in a quart to two quarts of water and that's a very strong bleach solution it pretty much kills anything on contact if there's anything in there and I swish it all around and you can leave it open to the air so that it dries a little while, but with that strong of a bleach solution, I don't usually do that. I leave it um, after I've dumped all the water out. The residual in there is enough to sanitize the water that I'm putting back in, if it even needs sanitizing. Our water is really good, and so it really doesn't need that, but we do it anyway just for redundancy to be sure that it's safe. And that brings us right to how do you prepare the water? If you're pulling the water out of your tap or out of your well and you want to store it, uh, someone made a really good point. She said, we have a well, but I can't depend on that in a grid down situation because the pump for our well is electric. And so we also need to store water aside from being able to pull it out of our well. And that's really good thinking. And so when we pull the water from whatever source we um, have, then what do we do? Can we just put it in and put the lid on and leave it? That actually brings me to address one of the questions that we get over and over and over and over again, and that is, so-and-so says this, and so-and-so says this, and so-and-so does this, which is the right way to do it? Well, when we are canning, 
there is definitely a right, well, there's definitely a safe and an unsafe way. Sometimes there's pretty clear line between what should and what should not be done. But in things like water storage, you're going to have lots and lots and lots of opinions. And so what do you do? People ask me, which is right, which is right? It is very individualized. And what we need to do is just not wait for someone to tell us what to do, but rather we need to do a little bit of research on our own and then decide. Now I am going to put about, I think, three references having to do with water and water storage and water safety right below this video. And if you look at all three, you will find they don't agree with each other. And you know, that is fine. That is just fine. Because that gives you a broader view of what people are saying. And then you can make your own decisions based on what your own needs are. One of the things in preparing the water to go into storage, some sources say if it comes from a municipal source, it is already treated. You don't need to add anything extra. In the reference from the state of Utah that I'm going to give you, you will find that there's a contradiction even within that one document. They give you the amounts of Clorox that you should put in stored water, but a little bit later they say, oh, but if your water is treated, you don't even need to do that. So you have to figure out what helps you feel the safest and what is the safest for your consumption. You do not want to over-treat water. This is, I told one of our viewers, Garbage in, garbage out. If you put nasty water in, you're going to get nasty water out. Because our water is so good, it's spring water, it comes from underneath the sandstone mountains here, so that water has filtered down through Navajo sandstone thousands of feet, so it's really good water. So Jim and I do not add anything extra other than when I rinse out the barrels with the Clorox water get all the water out, and then put the water that we're going to be storing in. We don't do anything else up front. But if it makes you feel better and feel safer, do it, but don't put too much in. The references that I'm going to give you will tell you how much of different things to put in. I'm not going to talk about that today, because what is right uh, for you may not be right for us. And so it's that kind of a thing. You need to figure that out for yourself. The next question was, this is our second to the last question, how do I sanitize water if it gets contaminated? We were in a grit down situation and every drop of water was precious because we did not have another source to replenish our supplies. You can better believe if I found a little bit of mold on the underside of this lid, I would be sanitizing this water so that we would not waste it. Well, what do we use for sanitizing water? In the comments under our micro moment video there was a lot of mention of different things that you can use to sanitize water and that's true there are a number of things out there but when it comes to storing larger amounts of water there is pretty clear recommendation for the order of things that you should consider in doing that the first thing is boiling and so I could dump this in a pan, and according to the CDC, what I could do is bring that to a, a boil, a nice rolling boil, and boil it for one minute. If I live above 6,500 feet, then I would boil it for two minutes. Other references say 10 minutes. So here again, you just need to decide. I would err on the side of a little bit more here rather than a little bit less because I'm not dumping chemicals in it. I'm just doing something physical to the water. And so I have greater latitude. So I would boil this and let it cool completely and then it would be okay to drink or brush teeth or whatever. Now when, if I were to open this much what I, and found it to be contaminated, would I want to boil it? Well, it, you know, boiling depends. It depends on what else we have uh, the availability of. Do we have enough fuel to boil all of our water? Do we have enough pots that we can do that? Or is there something else? So yes, there is something else. And these, the order of these three things is pretty constant across when you are thinking of doing larger amounts of water. Boiling is first. Then comes chlorination. And I know some of you are opposed to this, but I will tell you that I'm not. Um, someone said, 
use something else other than something that, that is toxic to humans. Well, it is toxic if I drink it, it's going to kill me. Uh, the same with hydrogen peroxide, if I drink it, it's going to kill me. So it depends, it just depends. A little tiny bit is not going to kill you, but rather it is going to serve us well. It is going to kill things, um, live things, and it will denature other things that are in the water. And so a, a chlorine treatment is a really good option for what we can do. Now, are there other ways of doing things? Yes, so if you're going to pick another way of doing your water, then please do the research. Chlorine is the least expensive way to do it, and it is the most effective given uh, uh, under the circumstances that we might be living in. But there's one problem. I'm showing you this bleach. Now, I'm also not going to give you the amounts of bleach because it varies. What you need to do is look on your bleach bottle where it uh, shows the ingredients. And then you need to look at the active ingredients. And the active ingredient here, sodium hypochlorite. Sodium hypochlorite and it is 6.05 percent. Uh, bleach in the United States is between 605 and about 68 uh, percent of calcium hypochlorite. And one of the references that I have shows a table that if yours says 6 percent, this is how many drops you put. If yours is 8 percent, this is how many drops you put in various things. And it is important to follow that. Do not over-chlorinate your water. Don't under-chlorinate it. If you're going to err, it is better to err a little bit on the side of doing a little bit more, but not a whole lot more, because you want to keep it to the point where it doesn't harm us. The problem with Clorox is that after six months, sitting on your shelf, you cannot count on it being 100% strength it begins to deteriorate and lose the chlorine. The chlorine gas escapes, it really does, out through this plastic, and it becomes uh, weaker and weaker as time goes by. By the time it's a year, you would never want to use Clorox to sanitize your water. Well, is there something else? And in our other videos, I go through this same line of logic, and, and the answer is yes, there is. And to me, this is what we use. <clears throat> this is, now bleach was um, sodium hypochlorite. This is calcium hypochlorite, calcium. So it is different and this is in powdered form. The EPA says that we can use this Others say that we can use this, so this is safe to use for water purification, for water sanitizing. Now, a couple of caveats. This is also known as pool shock. Those of you with swimming pools probably use a product, either this product or one similar to it. Here again is what you need to be very, very careful about. Look at the ingredients. Look at the active ingredients. Calcium hypochlorite, 73%. You want that number to be 68% or higher for this recipe that I'm gonna give you in just a minute. This recipe comes from the EPA. Then it says other ingredients, 27%. But when it says other ingredients, those are inert. They are not contributing to anything else. <clears throat> when you buy pool shock, you do not want an algae killer added. Now this will take care of algae, but sometimes they reduce the calcium hypochlorite and put another chemical in that will kill algae. I'm sorry, but you don't want to be drinking that. So make sure whatever you buy, if you decide to go this route, that the only active ingredient is calcium hypochlorite and it's above 68%. Now, this will not hurt you. This um, is powdered form. It looks just like detergent. One of the things that you need to remember is you always put this into the water 
that you're going to mix up here in just a minute, you don't do the other way around. You don't put the powder in and then pour in the water because it's kind of explosive. It'll splash wildly if you do that. But if you pour it into a whole bunch of, of water, then that's not going to hurt a thing. One of these will do hundreds and hundreds of gallons of water. We gave these as Christmas gifts to my children, oh, probably about three years ago, and I made up these labels. And also, please store this stuff in either glass or plastic because the fumes coming off here are corrosive to metal. So we store it in this big gallon container so it has lots of room in there. And then with this plastic lid, no metal. And I actually keep this in the house because I don't want this heating up or anything else. I'm wanting to keep it here. And um, this lasts on your shelf for years, indefinitely. Well, how do you use it? Um, and so, according to the EPA, what you need to do is take, now this is sugar, I'm using sugar, a heaping teaspoon of that powder and mix it into two gallons of water. And, and then you have what is called a base solution. Here is my base solution that I have recently made up. <clears throat> and it will be a little bit cloudy like that when you make it up. And again, I've made this little label for with my computer that I stick on this. This is calcium hypochlorite base solution. The base solution is way stronger, a hundred times too strong. And so from this base solution, then um, if those two gallons, the ratio is one to a hundred. And so those two gallons of base solution is enough to sanitize 200 gallons of contaminated water or just water. Now, there's no way I need to mix up that much. I don't need a whole heaping teaspoon. So, this pint right here of base solution will do 100 pints of water, which is six and a half gallons. But how do I get it to here? Well, mathematically, I kept saying, okay, well, if one teaspoon heaping does two gallons, then a heaping half teaspoon will do one gallon and if I reduce that down to one eighth of a teaspoon, wait a minute, I don't have an eighth of a teaspoon, I have a fourth of a teaspoon, half of a fourth of a teaspoon, that's one eighth, would do this. Well how much is an eighth of a teaspoon? Well I just happen to have this little tiny set and half of a fourth of a teaspoon is an eighth of a teaspoon. An eighth of a teaspoon is the same thing as a dash. And that is this much. This much of that powder does a quart. So then it's one sixteenth, it's half of this then that does a pint. And that's all that I put in here. So what is a sixteenth of a teaspoon? It is a pinch. Now I took some time yesterday to, to figure out if I take a pinch, is that really the same amount as this little teaspoon right here that is labeled pinch? And so I pinched it, I put it on a piece of paper, and then I made a little funnel and put it in there, and it's exactly that. It is exactly that. So if you don't have this, then you can just take a pinch of this powder and put it in a pint and mix it up. And so then I have this base solution. If I'm going to be sanitizing water in a five gallon jug, I've also done the math and it is just a little around three fourths of a cup of the base solution in five gallons of water. So the amount of chlorine that is used here is so tiny, 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 but it does the job and it makes our water safe. Now the last thing I wanted to talk about is, somebody asked, so if your water has been stored for a long time, how does it taste? We're going to find out. 
So the question, how do I make my stored water taste better? If you've put good water in here and leave it for, this has been stored for four years right here in our kitchen and I have not touched it until the day that we did our video on our outdoor off-grid kitchen. And then I emptied half of this out so I could handle it better as I carried it out there. Well, I didn't dump it out. I watered plants and so forth. But um, So this has, has remained untouched and untreated for four years. The rest, the half that is left in here is four-year-old water that has been stored. So I'm going to taste it on camera and we'll see. One of the things that happens, first of all, this is crystal clear. And that's how it was when we put it in, so that's good. If your water is cloudy, you're going to want to filter it before you do any sanitizing. And in our other videos, I go into great detail about filtering and the size of filters that you need in order to filter out a bunch of stuff. So then, the next thing is to smell it. So it looks clean. Smell it. There is no off odor, so I'm going to taste it. It does not taste like the water that came out of our tap. It's flat. Will it do? Oh gosh, absolutely. But if I wanted to jazz it up a little bit, I'm going to pour it back and forth between these two containers, being careful not to spill any. Because every drop is precious. And then what we're... <sighs> Too much spilling. What we're doing here is re-oxygenating the water because that's what happens to stored water. It gets flat because the oxygen leaves. So we're just reoxygenating it. And you know how oxygenated our water is when it comes out of the tap. You can almost see the bubbles. That improved it quite a bit. Still not to the same quality as our tap water, but this would be absolutely fine. And so it's delightful that this water is still um, pretty much as good as it was when we put it in there four years ago. You will also find differing recommendations for how often you should empty out your water and then um, refill the barrels for, with fresh water. Six months to a year is the usual recommendation. My brain tells me why in the world. Water, if you've put good water in and you've put it in a, a sanitized container, what's going to happen to it in there? Well, most likely nothing. One of the reasons why we do it in varying barrels is so that if one goes bad, they all won't go bad. That's one of the downsides of putting it in 50 gallon barrels, and we have some of those in any case. But we do ours about every five years, and I'm even wondering why do we do that? Because every time we do it, the water tastes great. It tastes about like this. We reoxygenate it, and that would be perfectly good. So that is something that you're going to have to figure out for yourself. Do some trial and error in figuring that out. So, boiling, chlorination. If chlorination is not a possibility, you can also consider distillation. It's a little bit more complex and you have to have plenty of fuel and the equipment to do it. For my money and for my time and for my feelings of well-being, we will be planning on doing chlorination with this calcium hypochlorite. To me, this is the answer. I hope this has been useful for you. I hope that if you have not yet started a water supply, that you will start with something. Once your jars of mayonnaise are empty, fill them up with water. Uh, buy some bottled water. That We're having a case lot sale right here, and we could have picked up a whole case for $2.99. And so get some water on hand so that you won't be one of the ones that is standing in line waiting for FEMA to bring the water truck so that you can then get your ration of water. That to me is a little bit scary. I want to be self-sufficient, self-reliance so that we can rely on the things that we have stored. And I hope that you are moving in that direction as well. So thank you for watching and we will see you at our next video.